Ja, einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture and Film. Eine ganz, ganz spannende Reihe. Wir haben schon ein Jahr lang über Godard gesprochen und viele Experten hier gehabt. Und jetzt ist das die zweite Veranstaltung, die sich auf Andy Warhol bezieht. Und die Reihe heißt Easier Than Painting und sie wäre nicht möglich, ohne die enge Zusammenarbeit mit der Universität ganz besonders die vier Organisatoren zu nennen. Eben Vinzenz Hediger, Marc Siegel von der Filmwissenschaft und Regine Prange und Henning Engelke von der Kunsthistorik. Dafür schon mal einen herzlichen Dank, dass wir diese Reihe und diese tollen Experten hier ins Haus holen konnten. Ein Applaus, bitte. Es sind 15 Veranstaltungen, eine haben wir schon hinter uns, 14 stehen noch bevor und äh, die sind alle was ganz Besonderes, denn die Kopien kommen aus dem Museum of Modern Art, sind alle restauriert und werden original in 16 mm gezeigt, so wie Warhol sie auch gedreht hat und vorgeführt hat. Das ist also wirklich was, was man sonst hier nicht so oft zu sehen bekommt und das in Kombination mit den Vortragenden, Ganz besonders heute, denn heute haben wir jemanden hier, der bei Wall sogar vor der Kamera stand. Und das wird mit Sicherheit noch ein spannendes Erlebnis werden, was Amy Torvin heute zu berichten hat. Ich werde jetzt nicht mehr viel zu ihr sagen, ich sage noch ein bisschen was Organisatorisches. Die Reihe wird begleitet durch eine Reihe, in der wir versuchen, die verschiedenen Facetten des Popkinos zu beleuchten. Das machen wir immer mittwochs und samstags um 18 Uhr. Und ähm, ja, in diesem Monat ist es das populärere Popkino mit diesem Retro-Aspekt. Da ist dann Back to the Future dabei im Original und Ghostbusters zum Beispiel, aber auch Four Rooms äh, von Tarantino und Rodriguez unter anderem. Also um immer mal ins Programm schauen. Es lohnt sich auch da, Filme im Original zu sehen, die man sonst nicht mehr im Kino zu sehen bekommt. Guten Abend. Willkommen. Welcome. Aufgrund unserem amerikanischen Gast. Gast werde ich jetzt ins Englische wechseln, was mir recht ist. Um, <laughs> ich hoffe, um, es ist auch Ihnen recht. I'm particularly thrilled to be able to introduce Amy Taubin tonight. I have to say that although we have so many wonderful guests in this Warhol lecture and film series, I was most excited um, about welcoming Amy to Frankfurt to Frankfurt for the first time, as I find out, and to the German Film Museum in the context of this series. Allow me to say a few words about her in order to make it clear why she makes such a special contribution to the series. Amy is one of the most important film critics working in the English language today. For about the past three decades, she has written regularly about avant-garde and commercial narrative film for such publications as Art Forum, Sight and Sound, and Film Comment. And she's a contributing editor of the last two publications. As well as magazines and newspapers such as the New York Times, The Village Voice, and Ms. She's the author of a book on Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, published in BFI's Film Classic series, as well as numerous contributions to anthologies and museum catalogs. She currently teaches in the program of programs of art history and photography at the School of the Visual Arts in New York. While Taubin's work as a film critic reaches a broad audience and has received well-deserved praise, for instance, in 2007, she received New York's Anthology Film Archive's Siegfried Krakauer Award for critical writing. But although um, her work her, as a critic has reached such a broad audience, many people don't know that in the 1960s, Taubin actually started a career as an actress, quite successful career appearing both on Broadway and off Broadway, and later in avant-garde works by figures such as Richard Foreman. From 1983 to 87, she was the film and video curator at the key interdisciplinary art space in New York, The Kitchen. But Taubin not only curated and attended avant-garde film and performance events in New York and elsewhere since the early 1960s, she also made her own films and created her own interdisciplinary performances. Her one extant film, In the Bag, from 1981, has recently been restored by Anthology Film Archives and, it is, in, and is in the collection of MoMA in New York and the Arsenal in Berlin. Additionally, and particularly relevant in our context tonight, 
Taubin appeared in some very significant avant-garde films as well, namely Michael Snow's 1967 Wavelength. But three years prior to that classic structural film, she sat for two of Andy Warhol's screen tests and for one reel of the film Couch, a film that will be the closing film in this series in July. So Amy's, Amy's presence is a kind of bookend to the series. Warhol so valued Taubin's screen tests that he included them in his ever evolving compilation film, 13 Most Beautiful Women. So Amy, as Urs Spuri rightly mentioned, is the only person speaking in the series who has first-hand experience in front of Warhol's camera, which coupled with her critical acumen and her great analytic and descriptive capabilities make her a unique commentator on the aesthetic innovations and the human or inhuman devastations that mark Warhol's camera, Warhol's world, and Warhol's films. Before I welcome Amy, I would like to point out that she um, will break with convention and will um, give about a 40 minute talk in advance. And then after the film, she would like to return before the question and answer session to speak briefly for about 10 more minutes. And then we will engage in a question and answer session together. So without further ado, and with great pleasure, I welcome Amy Taubin. Thank you very much, Mark. Everyone else, thank you very much for hosting me. Um, I'm also going to do something I think is relatively unconventional in that I'm going to try to talk to you as opposed to lecture. I'm not a very good lecturer and I'm okay improvising um, from notes. I um, think improvisation is probably appropriate to the film we're going to see tonight, Beauty Number no. 2, which is, in terms of its dialogue, entirely improvised uh, with a secret agenda by one of the participants. Um, I think that most of you know that between 1963 and 1968, Warhol spent an enormous amount of his energy making films. Um, after 1968, he seems to have lost interest in this enterprise, not seems, he did lose interest. Um, and the films were, by 1972, withdrawn from circulation. Um, they lived in various storerooms uh, in Andy's workspace, which was first called the Silver Factory and after that the factory. He had no interest in looking at them, in showing them for various reasons, which I'll come to soon. Um, and they were only saved because John Hanhart, um, who was then the curator of film and video at the Whitney Museum, went to Andy and said, this is a very important body of work. And the Whitney, with the help of the Museum of Modern Art and the coming into being at that point, the Warhol Museum, uh, and what would come after Andy's death to be the Andy Warhol Foundation. But at first, just the Whitney and the MoMA want to preserve these films. Uh, and the first step in preserving them was to catalog them, um, which was a monumental task. Uh, at first, there seemed to be well over 400 films just lying in cans, most of it what's called camera original because Warhol never bothered to make prints, just showed camera original. Uh, some of it, like some of the screen tests that were shown often and toured in situations like the exploding plastic inevitable, there were prints of those. Films were badly mislabeled, they were in the wrong cans, no one knew what they were, no one knew who the people in them were. 
And the first over 20 years of this monumental task fell to Callie Angel, who did just enormous work uh, working on what would become a catalog resume of the Warhol films. And to do that, the films had to be restored. I mean, you could not look at uh, camera original very often without destroying it. And so the making of the catalog resume and the restoring of the film went hand in hand. Of course, the catalog resume is much further along than the restoration. There are many, many films not restored and which may never be restored. Um, gradually, the films that have been restored are coming into some circulation. Um, they are being distributed in part uh, by the Museum of Modern Art simply in their circulating film program. Um, and the MoMA largely is distributing those films as they should be seen and as Beauty Number no. 2 will be seen tonight uh, as a 16 millimeter print. Um, on the other hand, and you know, I have many uh, axes to grind, and uh, out, I am outraged by some parts of the exhibition of Warhol films, uh, partly what happens in the Warhol Museum, where um, the films are shown as terrible, terrible video projections. Um, Originally, the Warhol Museum, at the time that they began, made very bad analog video, three-quarter inch video. Hooray, three-quarter inch video, sometimes one inch video. Have you ever heard of such formats yourselves? No, they are obsolete, but they made them. And when they decided that they wanted to show this work, um, they transferred those analogs directly to digital formats, to DVDs, sometimes to, not quite to DCPs, they don't have DCPs. Um, and that is the way the Warhol films are being seen. Garbagey, original transfers to video on three quarter, then transferred that garbage to digital formats, as I wrote in art form, garbage in, garbage out. That's not the content or the form of the film, but certainly the technology by, through which those terrible transfers were made. So you don't know how lucky you are to largely see in this series 16 millimeter films. Now, I'm not a purist, and some of these films are impossible to get hold of in any other way than terrible bootlegs uh, that people like me have, uh, barely visible but lovingly made off the TV. And in classroom situations, I think better than nothing, you know? At least you get an idea of what was going on. But I would be very, very, very wary of uh, the Warhol films that you see in museums on little screens, kind of as part of installations. I would be very wary of them, and I would think maybe the reason that they seem so bad is that they've lost their original reason for being, which was Andy's passion for the movies he saw as a child, uh, and some of you know that, you know, Andy used to write, when he was a child, fan letters to Shirley Temple. And if you want to know a key to who Andy was as his presentation of self, think about Shirley Temple the next time you look at Andy Warhol. Um, and he had a real, real, real passion, first for Hollywood cinema and for Hollywood cinema stars and for that image that you saw on the big screen in all its scratched, flickering glory. 
Um, and that's really what brought him to film. That and his initial involvement with what has been variously called American underground film, the new American cinema, uh, really kind of uh, bad choice of title, um, uh, experimental movies and avant-garde movies. Um, from the time he came to New York in the mid-50s, uh, Andy was ever-present on the downtown art scene. More on the periphery of that scene, probably, than in the galleries themselves. Um, he went to drag performances. He went to performances at the Judson Church. He went to um, clubs where voguing began in Harlem. He went all over. Uh, his interest was largely related to gender. Uh, Andy was out and gay long before any major artist in um, the New York art world was out. Uh, some people said he simply couldn't help it. Uh, I would suggest that he was un incapable of concealing it and didn't want to. Um, he became extremely interested through Jonas Mekas in avant-garde film, and I think that's true for a number of reasons. One, he saw that filmmakers like Jack Smith, uh, and now we realize, um, and I may get back to this, Stan Brakhage made films as part of their daily lives, and they made them for little or no money, um, for the cost of a roll of film that, in the case of Jack Smith, he would pick up for 50 cents on Canal Street. It was outdated. He didn't care. Um, uh, mismatched roles. Uh, Jack essentially made movies from garbage from the discards of the world. Uh, the people in his movie would discards. The stuff it was made of were discards. And the result was gloriously beautiful. Um, and Andy understood something of the beginning of how you could become a filmmaker, even though you were a person who probably was, at that point, unacceptable to the Hollywood industry. I don't think he ever lost the hope that someday he would be acceptable, and he made the mistake of thinking that the films he made would be his entree in one way or another to Hollywood, whereas what actually happened was the Hollywood people um, couldn't make head or tail of these films and certainly did not see from them that Andy was in any way had the talents or the interest or the proclivities of a, a, um, a film director whose work would be in the multiplex. And that was true even after Chelsea Girls became the highest grossing American independent film at the point in 1966-67. Uh, and the first independent film to be on the variety charts uh, as making over a million dollars. Um, and that turned Andy's head somewhat, and he tried to make follow-ups, and the follow-ups were never successful. Um, and I'll come back to this. Finally, he gave up this enterprise altogether. Um, Andy's filmmaking, how shall I say this, did not, ple in the same way that it was clear, and should have been clear to him, that this would not be an entree into Hollywood, it also um, made problems for him in the art world of the 60s. Uh, his dealers 
the museums that were interested in him very badly wanted to keep these films under wraps. Um, they thought they were dirty movies. They thought they were gay dirty movies. Uh, and they believed that people who wanted to pay big money for a major artist uh, did not want to know the kinds of things that were in this film, these films about the artists. On top of that, some of you also know that most people who are involved with visual art as painting and sculpture um, have very little patience for time-based mediums, um, do not really want to sit through even a four-minute film, uh, not to mention uh, a 66-minute film, or in the end, of a five-hour film, or um, as uh, Four Stars was imagined, a 25, and shown actually once, a 25-hour film. Uh, Time-based mediums are very irritating to people who look at painting and sculpture and want to look at the thing in their own time. That's not to say that people who are serious about painting don't spend an enormous amount of time with the paintings, but they do it in their own time, as opposed to having the time framed for you and dictated to you by the length of the film on the screen. Uh, so there was big resistance to this film, and I think that Leo Castelli and Eliana Sonnabend were extremely happy when Andy seemed in 1968 totally to lose interest in film, even though his next step was to make business art, and he had probably pretty much gone through his best years as a painter, and all his years as a filmmaker. Um, there was There is a kind of revival of Andy's painting in the late years, in the shadow paintings, and the kind of deathhead self-portraits. But the great films, actually, uh, I'm sorry, the great paintings were being made simultaneously with the great films in the years 1963, 1964, and 1965. Um, and you can see by looking at the films together with uh, the paintings, the dialectical relationship between them. Um, this was actually brilliantly done in a show that I forgive for having digital projections of films. They were beautiful digital projections. Um, a show which David Cronenberg put together um, in Canada um, at the AGO. And uh, this was a, f a show which showed the paintings from 63 to 65, some of the great paintings, the Elvises, um, the burning car crashes, some electric chairs, some um, uh, race riots, um, in the same room as the silent films were being projected. And so you had a situation where, say, one of the electric chair paintings was framed on one hand by a projection of blowjob on one side, and on the other side by, um, now what was it? It was sleep on the other side of the electric chair, I believe, and I think my memory is faulty here. Definitely blowjob, maybe sleep. Um, I'd have to double check. Uh, in the electric chair paintings, if you know them, there, it's an empty room with an electric chair in the middle. Most of them are silver. Um, and in the extreme right-hand side of the image, at the top, there's a tiny uh, sign that says, Silence. And, of course, silence uh, governed the films of those periods. But to see blowjob 
next to the electric chair made you think both about death and the little death that is orgasm, but it also made you think about the issue of criminality, right? Um, the criminality of the act in blowjob, which you don't see on the screen, but it is, blowjob is a, a medium shot cut off at the waist of a guy who is clearly getting a blowjob, which is going on below the frame line. Um, and the criminality and uh, penalty for that act bleeds across from the uh, image of the electric chair to um, uh, to to blowjob and reciprocally the little death of blowjob uh, bleeds across into the image of the electric chair. Um, and these relationships were so clear in that show. If you visited Warhol's studio, as I did very for a brief period of time, you were very aware of how these ideas were coming one from the other. And formally, I think that what is at the basis of Warhol's films, what makes them formally, aesthetically great films, is his understanding that film is a moving image and that he could frame time passing in film. Whereas in painting, in a lot of the paintings of that period, time stilled is repeated multiple times in a single painting. So if you think of the, uh, the images, say, in car crashes, it's the, in the car crash paintings from the Death and Disaster series, or even what might happen in that electric chair were a person brought in to sit in it. The subject of those paintings is the moment of death. In other words, that moment stilled and fetishistically, dreadfully repeated again and again and again because that is the terrifying moment and that is the moment where time no longer matters. Um, and for me, the power of those films comes in part from looking at the paintings that are made at the same time. Okay, so let me now come to a film that was made relatively late in this period, Beauty Number Two, which we're going to look at today. And then I'll circle back a little bit and talk a little bit more about how Andy got involved, came to Beauty Number Two after a number of other films. Um, Or, or let me not circle back, let me do it now. Um, Andy began by making silent films. And he m began by making silent films with a camera that Jonas Mekas gave him. Uh, it was a famous camera. It had been used to shoot flaming creatures, for example. It was used by Barbara Rubin to shoot Christmas on Earth, and then Andy borrowed it and very quickly because he was already beginning to be a wealthy artist. Uh, he bought his own. Uh, and it was at first a 16 millimeter wind up Bolex. He knew nothing about cameras. The wind up Bolex only shot 20 seconds. And he realized very quickly that that was fairly useless uh, for his purposes. And so he got a Bolex with a motor. And that could shoot a two and a half minute roll of 16 millimeter film, which. If you slowed it down in the way that Andy slowed it down, uh, lasted four minutes on the screen. Um, and the first films were made with that camera, including sleep. So Andy had to, and this is just beginning to 
come to the surface, how he had to figure out how to make sleep without breaks, where, you know, someone in their sleep does move, and suddenly you put in a roll, it takes two and a half minutes, you have to shut down, put another roll in the camera, and the person has moved, and it doesn't look that like they're continually sleeping. And so for sleep, he developed this method of printing each roll twice and looping and printing one backwards. Uh, not reverse, but backwards, which was complicated at that point. And so it would go to the beginning of the roll, and then he would splice the last frame to the last frame and come around again. Sleep is very interesting to look at because now we have to try to figure out exactly how many minutes of John Giorno is sleeping in sleep. Not very many. Uh, sleep is this film of many, many reputations repetitions, not five and a half continuous hours of a man sleeping, even though John Giorno um, said very recently at the Museum of Modern Art that Andy, even in by 1963, was using enormous amounts of speed, so he never slept, and that was part of the reason for his enormous productivity, where Giorno just drank, and so Giorno was always sleeping, and they were boyfriends. Uh, and so Andy, who could not go to sleep, used to watch Giorno sleep and uh, uh, finally thought, well, this would be a great film. Um, uh, so Sleep was a very long, silent film. Uh, but most of what Andy was doing in those days were films that exploited this single two-and-a-half-minute role. And they are the films which are which were known as stillies, and which then became the screen tests, uh, were rechristened screen tests. And basically, anyone who came first to Andy's apartment because he didn't yet have the factory, and then anyone who he was interested in for any number of reasons, he thought they were beautiful, or he was interested in them. Uh, sexually or whatever, or wanted to keep them around, he'd screen test them. Um, and there are approximately, I think, what, over 300 screen tests. Um, what's very important about the screen tests is that people were instructed to behave really as if they were dead. They were instructed, I was instructed, uh, the first time I went to the factory, Andy said, oh, we have to have a screen test of you. And I said, okay. Um, and uh, he, he took me back to this little setup where, amazingly, there was only a single light and that Bolex, and he had a great eye because everyone looks gorgeous in their screen tests. Um, he knew exactly the angle at which to shoot you. Um, he knew exactly how to place that single light. And then he just said, look straight into the camera, try not to move and not to blink, and walked away and left you to your own devices, which was a hideous experience for almost anyone. Imagine sitting there and not being allowed to move or do anything to make yourself interesting or what, or follow your impulses. No, you had to behave like a dead person for um, two and a half minutes. Um, it was a great confrontation with the idea you had of your own image. And for most people who came to the factory, in the ensuing years, they came because the cameras were always running. And so they came to be photographed and to have their image made immortal by someone whose reputation as an artist was growing. Um, and then they had, either in the screen tests or then in longer forms, um, this confrontation with the camera, which in most cases did not gratify one's narcissism. Indeed, one came away from this experience with deep wounds 
in one's narcissism. And maybe those wounds for some people could be enlightening, but for a lot of people, they ended very tragically. Um, because, you know, if you want to have your image recorded by a camera and you care about your image, you are already narcissistic, and that means you are already fragile. And uh, then to have that narcissism torn apart, that can be a very difficult situation, which is something that we're going to see extended in 66 minutes in beauty number two. Um, the thing, however, to get back to the short stillies that Andy discovered very quickly was they were much more interesting. They were shot in what's called real time, 24 frames per second, but they were much more interesting to look at if they were slowed down and projected in slow motion on the kind of projector that existed in those days, which was a variable speed projector, which was were used to show silent films. And so one of the first things about the Warhol silence is their time is not your time, you in the audience. You are sitting out there functioning as a person in real time. You breathe in real time, your heart beats in real time, whether you know it or not, consciously, your body clock works in a set, certain way, which is the real time way. On the screen, those people are not moving in real time. Their body clocks are slowed down. They um, live in a different time than you, the viewer, watching them. And one becomes aware of that. It's not just pleasing slow motion. It's a real sense of a gap between you here and them on the screen. And it was Warhol's, I think, way of marking what Stan Brakhage was talking about at the same time as how do we preserve the aesthetic distance in a moving image? How do we uh, give the audience the sense that we don't want them to go inside the image, to be able to just enter that space as if it was there and identify and feel fear and desire. No, we want to preserve something that we know from painting and sculpture as aesthetic distance. We are separate from the object, as engrossed as we are from it. And he hit upon this thing of the slow motion in the silent films. Then, I think the silent films ran their course, and at the same time, Jonas Mekas presented Andy with a new kind of camera. It was the Oricon. Um, and it was a camera that was used largely for news gathering. Um, it, it was a peculiar camera. Um, it recorded on a single strip that already had a magnetic uh, track on one side of where the image was recorded. You recorded sound simultaneously, not like this double system that 60 millimeter filmmakers had to do and sync and clapboards and crystals and all that stuff. This was really easy to use. Um, you just recorded simultaneously the sound and the image. What this meant was you couldn't cut because of that whole thing with sound advanced. You just had to go straight through, kind of like early porta pack stuff where you couldn't cut either because that was magnetic tape. Um, so there was no editing unless you edited in the camera turned it on and turned it off. And there's a moment in Beauty 2 in the second reel where the camera clearly gets turned off and there is this edit. And it's an interesting edit to note because it underlines uh, something that's said at that moment. It's a little speech about, well, what is voyeurism? Click and the camera goes off and click, it comes back on 
and they've jumped ahead a little bit. Um, a moment I think of genius, and not by Andy, because I don't think Andy was there all through the making of Beauty Number no. 2. Um, so we don't know who to attribute that to. Anyway, the um, sound films, therefore, were made of the Oricon also, unlike the sync sound systems that the Verite filmmakers were using. Uh, they ran 33 minutes straight through of real time. Um, and so Andy started making these 33-minute films and then these 66-minute films films, and I think probably the thing that bothered him about them is that he had difficulty with real time. After the experience of the stillies and slow motions and the aesthetic distance, and so he began to devise other ways to make that time different than your time. Uh, one of the primary ways was to project the films double screened so that two 33 minute reels that were shot sequentially were then projected side by side simultaneously or sometimes the things that were projected simultaneously had nothing to do with one another in terms of uh, um, being directly connected in time and space like in the Chelsea Girls the reels are arranged after the fact and um, for a while fairly randomly and, and they came to take on a pattern. Um, but the thing is, you sitting out there looking at a double screen film, you can move from one image to the other, or you can try to use your peripheral vision and see it kind of as one kind of out of focus image. You can try a lot of things. It's not your time. You don't live in double time. And so it was another way that uh, Andy could make that time, the time on the screen, the time that he controlled, uh, different from, markedly different from real life. Um, there are very notable exceptions to that, and one of the, them is the film we're going to see tonight, which is one of the few films that was shot two consecutive 33-minute reels that was only intended and has only really been shown uh, as consecutive reels because it is a real narrative film. Um, so... Let me kind of talk a little bit around Andy Warhol's narrative attempts. Um, when Andy started making the longer films, he realized that you just couldn't have people just sitting there still doing nothing. Um, and he had made other kinds of films, which we're now beginning to see more of. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art just showed last week three films I had never seen that had never been shown. Very, very early 1963 films, um, in which there's not only a ton of camera movement, Andy is experimenting with using the camera, but he's doing brackage-style, in-camera edits every three frames, every four frames. Amazing, you know, completely, completely different than the stillies. And clearly he did this for a little while, lost interest in it. It was his brackage moment. Uh, it was his Jonas Meckes movement moment. It was the moment that was like what was really going on in New York in uh, experimental avant-garde film, which is that everyone was making diaries and everyone was walking around with a 16 millimeter camera shooting their girlfriends or their boyfriends or events or the flowers or whatever. Uh, and some of those filmmakers like uh, uh, Nathaniel Dorsky and Jonas himself are great filmmakers, but this was not something that interested Andy very much. Um, 
So, so after those little attempts at camera movement, occasionally later on he would move the camera a bit, not very much. Great film that you're going to see later in this series with the same superstar, Edie Sedgwick, um, Outer and Inner Space. There is camera movement. The camera's on a tripod, but there is um, a movement in, uh, in one, in the first reel that was shot, and in the second reel there's a movement out, and then when they're seen by side by side, you see a movement in and a movement out simultaneously. Very interesting. Um, so there were... Uh, Attempts to, you know, fool around and see what else could be done. But in general, there was a frame created and what we could call narrative tension um, came into play sometimes because of what people were doing to one another inside the frame, but just as often through um, the relationship between what was going on outside the frame and what was and what you could see in the frame. It was a very peculiar and interesting use of what all filmmakers were involved in, which is off-screen space. You know, you character looks over here and then the camera goes into the space that was formerly off screen and you see what's going on there and then it comes back. Um, films are always in dialogue between what you see on the screen and what you see off the screen. But for Andy, the off space and the on screen space existed simultaneously in a dynamic relationship throughout the entire film. And that's what's also central to beauty number two. Um, Edie Sedgwick came to the factory. Let me try. Oh, shoot. Let me try to keep track of time. Um, Edie Sedgwick, does it matter if I go over? All right. Um, Edie Sedgwick came to the factory, um, in March of 1965 and exited in December of 1965. In other words, her reign as the Andy Warhol superstar of that moment was short, not sweet. Um, she had been preceded by a series of superstars, and interestingly, the superstars were female, but they were also peripheral to the scene itself, and very often peripheral to the films or the events that they were part of. Um, there were also drag queen superstars. Um, I can think of no real male superstars. Very, very interesting. They only come much later when Andy isn't making films, but Paul Morrissey is making the films. So you have people like Paul America, and uh, um, but those are not really Warhol films. So the women are the superstars, but as Viva said, they really didn't count very much uh, because no one really at the factory had much use for women except this, these kind of oddities that they could sell to the media. Um, so first there was Naomi Levine, who... Uh, whose tenure as the first superstar was very, very short. Uh, and that's in part because Naomi was mad, I mean, clinically mad, and she made incredible demands on Andy, and he got very irritated, and she was uh, pretty much driven out of there. Uh, she claimed that she gave the idea for painting flowers to Andy, and therefore she had rights to those paintings and all kinds of things like that. Um, and she was followed, incredibly sweet woman, but mad as a hatter. Um, she was followed by Jane Holzer, baby Jane Holzer, uh, who also um, was an outsider to that scene and probably came 
because she was interested in painting and in acquiring some. Um, she was married to a very wealthy man. They were real estate interests. They lived on Park Avenue. Uh, and he liked to have people who had money and would buy paintings and bring him people who would buy paintings. So he liked that very much. Uh, and so Jane, who was a terrific woman and actually fantastic, Jane is one of the three female executive producers of Harmony Corrine's great film, Spring Breakers. Um, which I just think is totally amazing and appropriate. Um, so she was quickly over. She was followed then by Edie Sedgwick. And um, Edie Sedgwick uh, comes from, she grew up in California with a very large family of siblings. I think there were six and there, but basically she comes from a long line of Boston Brahmins. I mean, she was in the social register. She was different at that point from anyone else who had ever come to the factory, even though what was amazing about the factory, the most amazing thing was the cross-section of people who came there. Uh, from Rotten Rita the um, uh, amphetamine speed freak dealer and Edie Sedgwick and her Harvard crowd and uh, uh, Nurea dancing with Judy Garland, and um, which people just thought was a total bore when that happened. I mean, it was kind of wild um, that no one had any interest in seeing Nurea dance with Judy Garland. Um, it was this amazing cross-section, but Edie really, really was different, and she also came with money. She came with a large trust fund, which unfortunately, large in those days, it was over $100,000, which now would mean close to a million dollars, um, and she went through it in six months. Um, and when it was gone, she became a really sad, frightened person, and they no longer had any use for her. Um, she makes her debut in vinyl, and this thing that Beaver said about peripheral is very important. Uh, you'll see vinyl, lucky you all, on film in this series, and you will see Edie, and she is perched uh, in the extreme right-hand side of the frame, otherwise everyone in this film uh, which is supposedly a version of the Clockwork Orange, um, are gay. And there's a great deal of really scary stuff going on in the darkness in the background, which is that someone really is being tortured. And Edie is sitting on one side of the frame, not really oblivious, but not giving away how this might really affect someone who's like 22 years old and hasn't exactly led a sheltered life and maybe has had a history of a family with a huge amount of mental illness and abuse and, you know, but really had not experienced two guys torturing another guy who's strung up. Um, and she is just there kind of smoking a cigarette and pretending not to notice, and you cannot take your eyes off her. I mean, she steals the film. She is not. And Andy threw her into the film. She appeared at the factory, and he said, oh, why don't you get in the movie? And she did. Um, and that was how the E.D. period began. Uh the male actors in this film, some of them really resented that the uh, center of attention, even though they were center like Ger Gerard Malanga and had all the lines in the middle of the frame, and you look at the film, you don't look at Gerard, you just look at Edie. Um, so I think at that point, Andy realized what he had. He had someone who had genuine presence. And this is something that I must say 
Um, you know, people talk about Warhol and why he painted what he painted. And, um, you know, the Elvises and the Marilyns and uh, um, the Jackies and all of those paintings. And they say things like, well, it was easy to use a familiar image. Warhol, from beginning to end, was interested simply in the mystery of presence. What, why did some people have presence? Why did some objects have presence? Why did some images have presence and others didn't? And in terms of the paintings, he set out to take these images, which seemed to him to have presence, like Elvis or whatever, use the cheapest possible photographs, silk screen them to death so they were almost not legible, near the point of abstraction, and you looked at it and you said, my God, Elvis, he's gorgeous. Um, this was an indestructible image. And it always seemed to me that he was looking to see if the people who to him had presence were indestructible in the same way. And unfortunately, they were not. But clearly at the beginning, Edie had incredible presence. And the second film she did was Poor Little Rich Girl, an odd film which is shown always these days, not always, at Sundance actually I saw success of 33, then 33. First reel is totally out of focus. They forgot to focus the camera or someone knocked against the lens and it went out of focus. Uh, the second reel is in focus and it's basically Edie puttering around her apartment and talking on the film and you know, doing, looking at her clothes and talking to people on the telephone or in the off space. Nothing is happening, but the fact that the first half is completely out of focus or one side of the screen is completely out of focus and the other half is completely in focus fit into this Warhol project of how do I destroy presence without destroying it. And so Poor Little Rich Girl is a very, very, very interesting object. Um, after that, inner, uh, outer Outer and Inner Space, which I think is one of the great Warhol films, truly one of the greatest, uh, in which there are four EDs simultaneously on the screen because it has to be shown double screen. Uh, it's also one of the first pieces, if not the first piece of experimental video art. Before Nam June Pike, the Norelco company lent Warhol this uh, camera that was the forerunner of the Porta Pack and said, do something with it. And he shot an hour of Edie on, uh, with this porta pack uh, and then showed the image on a TV set while Edie stood in front of it and was filmed to successive 33-minute uh, um, reels while behind her, her own image was there and chattering. And so it was this kind of early comparison film video image. But... Mostly, it was, again, about some kind of splitting of that person who had incredible presence. What would you do if there was the ED profile and the ED full face and the ED in cruddy video that kept breaking up? Um, truly, inner and out, uh, I always do it wrong. Outer and Inner Space is an amazing film. Uh, then there were group films. Oh, there's an amazing film that's almost never shown called Face, which is a close-up of Edie's face when she's very, very high on speed. And, you know, those of you who've seen her, and you will see her tonight, she, ha she was an incredible beauty. Uh, she, was, she was small, or she was thin, and uh, her face was not conventionally beautiful, but extremely delicate, and never stopped moving. You know, in acting terms, an American actress like Julie Harris had that kind of face that seemed to vibrate all the time. There were so many tiny things 
going on inside of it. And Edie had that face. Um, if you had bigger features, you would look grotesque on the screen. But this was tiny and incredibly delicate, but like some kind of bird. Birds don't have that much expression, not good comparison. Some kind of tiny, tiny animal. Never, never stopped moving and vibrating. Uh, she was also in a bunch of group films. Uh, she, at that point, it was clear that she wasn't going to be Andy's ticket to Hollywood, which he thought she might be, because she couldn't learn her lines. And she was incredibly undisciplined. And she had started to do a horrible amount of drugs. Um, and, you know, she was just wasn't disciplined enough to be a model, let alone a commercial actress. Uh, and in she almost you know, destroyed herself in certain films with scripts by Ronald Tavell, uh, like Kitchen, where she refused to learn her lines or could not learn her lines. And so if you've seen Kitchen, which is a wonderful film, there is Edie. And she is constantly sneezing like she has a terrible cold. If she didn't have a cold, every time she sneezed, it cued a person who was behind the door to whisper her line to her in a disguised by the sound of the sneeze. Um, and she and Tavelle got on very badly. Tavelle was, I think, a, a really amazing writer. And he and Andy collaborated on some of the great talking films. Um, he also is the person, I think, who conceived of this idea of how could you torture the person on the screen by asking and commenting uh, from the off-screen space. But in Tavell's case, this was entirely scripted. Probably improvised off the script, probably went off the script, but supposedly there was a script there to begin with, and Tavell prided himself as a writer, so there was. Edie came into the factory with a guy named Chuck Ween, and Chuck was one of the Harvard cliques. He also was came from a relatively wealthy family, um, kind of sophisticated, in New York terms, uptown guy as opposed to a downtown guy. Um, and he and Edie were very close friends from the year that Edie spent at Harvard. And Chuck had already graduated, and but he was hanging out with younger people. Um, and he conceived this film that you're going to see tonight, Beauty Number no. 2. Um, what Andy had to do with this film, I do not know, really. Um, it is one of the rare films before Morrissey gets into the picture. Paul Morrissey, who later really made the films that were termed an Andy Warhol production. Um, at, the op at the very opening of the film, you will hear a voice, a uh, Chuck Wine's voice, perhaps, um, that tells you what you are going to see. Um, this is not just another pretty face. This is beauty number two. And then he describes the act, or in one line he says, uh, the two actors who are on the screen, Edie Sedgwick, and um, uh, a factory, at that point, relative newcomer, but still a guy who was at the factory, who was playing a role. And this is a fictional circumstance. The fictional circumstance is that Edie has gone to a disco called Arthur. At Arthur, she has picked up Gino, whose real name is was Gino Persecchio. But uh, in the introduction, the person who's introducing either can't remember Prosecchio or is giving him his screen name, which is Gino Possessed. Gino Possessed by the need to fuck Edie, which is why he has come home with her uh, to her tiny 
shadowy apartment, really scary apartment, kind of like the lighting in vinyl, where you think that horrible things could be happening in that very dark, unclear space, where in fact there is only a mirror that reflects nothing. Um, but you wonder, you don't, you know, you kind of think, I see why Edie didn't want to go back to that apartment alone. I would not like to sleep in that apartment alone. It was her apartment, but it's something very scary about it. Um, and um, so he talks about the three people involved in the film. I think he names himself as well. And then he says, around the camera, uh, Bud Woodshafter, who was a regular camera operator for Andy, uh, T.D. McDermott, and um, Gerard Malanger, and one other person who is the mode du jour, uh, which was a factory term for, I don't exactly know. Um, it's a play on the mode du jour, but it's the mode the word of the day. Uh, what he was doing there, I don't know. Um, Andy is not mentioned until the end of this little speech, and it is an Andy Warhol production. Frankly, I do not believe that anyone except Andy framed this image. Uh, I cannot see that any of those people were capable of the extraordinary framing of this image, because now I will tell you what happened in Beauty Number 2 so that you can see what to watch out for, but I will not tell you the ending of Beauty Number 2 because it is a narrative film with a, a shocker of an ending that is perfectly timed to be delivered in the last 20 seconds of the film, and you think, oh my God, that's what this was all about. Um, and then, you, of course, you want to see it again. No, I don't think so, but you might. Um, Edie is on the bed, and she is framed on this bed so that she's dressed in little bikini panties, black bikini panties and matching lace bra, and that's it. She's brought home this guy, and they're going to fuck him. Uh, but Chuck is there. Chuck has come to protect her. I don't know. Uh, later, Edie decides that he just wants to look. That's how he gets off. Of course, we know that's how Andy gets off. But Chuck just wants to look. And he is in the off-screen space. And so here is Edie in the middle of the bed. And that little strip of bikini pants is almost dead center, something slightly below in terms of the composition. And throughout the course of the film, Edie will turn this way and that way because she is being literally pulled apart. In front of her in the off space is Chuck, and Chuck is needling her. He is using all the personal information that he's privy to to get her to actually fall apart, to lose that incredibly learned social veneer, that upper class protection that is the only thing at this point that's keeping her from utter devastation. And she clings to it. Um, you see her in every film clinging to that. And he is really trying to destroy that. He is there facing her the way you're facing me. The camera, however, is there. And Edie, being very smart, knows she has to play to the camera. So in the setup, she is being pulled in both directions. And it soon becomes clear. And then there's Gino. And Gino is here. Now, he's not doing a very good job of trying to seduce her. I mean, he doesn't really care and you know they don't really get into it but he's putting the moves on her and so he's pulling her that way and mostly she doesn't want him in her light or, you know um and so she's got these three forces and she's getting and she's drunk and totally stoned and 
they want to break her. And the only way they will, the sign of breaking her is that she will reveal her crotch. You know, we see that little strip of bikini, but we, it's like Bridget Bardot on the Tahiti beach. You know, you have your legs together and you bend them and you move them that way and then you move them that way, but you don't do that. Um, And that's what they're trying to get her to do. So I won't tell you if it happens or it doesn't happen. Um, There's something you have to know about this film. Andy really didn't care about sound, which is, I think, why he had a problem with Tavell. Um, You can hear Chuck pretty well. Edie, because she's going back and forth between her camera angle and Gino and Chuck, and the mic is fixed in one place, and it's a terrible mic, you miss a lot of what she said. It doesn't matter a bit. Um, It really doesn't. Don't get outraged. This is not great wit. You know, most of the time she's saying, what do you mean, what do you mean? What do I mean? Yes, what do you mean when you ask me, what do I mean? I mean, it's really like that. Except there is this kind of undercurrent, and it comes from Chuck, and you will begin to maybe pick up on it. Um... The one other thing I want to say very quickly is that, I'm sorry, I'm going, I thought I had, you know, 15 minutes of talk. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> um, and uh, um, Beauty Number Two. What an interesting title. It might suggest that there was a film called Beauty Number One, and in the middle of the film there's a line that suggests that maybe this was a subject of discussion before the camera was turned on. Is there a Beauty Number One? Who is Beauty Number One? And who is Beauty Number Two? Is it uh, uh, Gino, or is it Edie, and what is it referred to? I don't know if in German the vernacular is the same, but in English... You know, when you're training kids, you ask them if they have to go, number one, urinate, or number two, they have to shit. So, Beauty Shit is the name of this film. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it.